Today we'll tell you about China's water transfer project. So let's get started. The CENWP wants to fix the lack of water in northern China by moving water from the Yangtze River in the south through tunnels that are 1,500 kilometers long. The eastern middle routes, which each took 10 years to build, have been used since 2013 and 2014, respectively, and can move 20.9 billion cubic meters of water each year. The west route should be done by the year 2050. On a 10-year study of the middle route, possible climate effects suggest that the sudden influx of water will change local evaporation and precipitation rates by bringing more convection, short intense rain to the area. Since the bay it rains affects the temperature, the experts think that the microclimate, the area will change as the project goes on. The cause of the problem is clear. Since ancient times, China has always been both blessed and cursed by its geography. Thanks to the Yangtze and Yellow River systems that flow from west to east, much of eastern China has always been permanently inhabited by human civilizations for thousands of years. And with fertile floodplains almost all year round, the land itself has been able to sustain an ever-growing Chinese population. In fact, China's Yellow River Valley is one of the largest and most consistently developed pieces of arable land in the entire world. On the other hand, the northern and far western parts of the country are either dry or mountainous. From the Taklamakan and Gobi deserts in the north to the unforgiving towering landscapes of the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, much of China's land to the northwest is sparsely populated and unsuitable for agriculture. This is perfectly highlighted by the fact that 94 of China's population lies east of this line. An imaginary line that divides the country into two contrasting halves, historically China's capital Beijing and its surrounding northern cities have long been, but as China's population and wealth grew in an unprecedented fashion in the middle of the 20th century, vital resources such as water, northern cities such as Beijing, have long relied on groundwater to sustain their populations. But because of an ever-increasing urban and industrial demand, this limited source of freshwater soon became overexploited. It also didn't help that the nearby Gobi Desert in China's Inner Mongolia autonomous region continuously been expanding along with more frequent dust and sand storms, as much as 3,600 square kilometers, or about twice the size of Luxembourg. The grasslands is being reclaimed by the desert every year in a process known as desertification. This desertification is mainly caused by human activities such as deforestation, climate change, and of course the aforementioned depletion of underground water sources. By the early 1950s, it became more evident that northern China would soon be unable to supply enough water population. Northern cities kept growing and water resources kept dwindling. China had to think of a way to somehow sustain hundreds of millions of people in an area that has historically been dry. In order to combat the emerging water shortage in northern China, Mao Zedong authority and centralized unified leadership as long as the most important. Rules are followed, everything will work out. This saying comes from Liu Shichu, queen also called master used spring and autumn annals. It was written around 239 BC by Lai Wei, who was the prime minister of the King Kingdom. It means that once you open the main rope of a net, everything else goes into place. This means that you need to understand the key to the whole situation in order to control everything and get the result you want. The saying shows why China's government is set up the way that it is and how the country is able to finish huge projects like the South to North Water Diversion Project from the top of the, the Chinese business and society all the way down to the villages cells of the Chinese Communist Party play important roles. So under the guidance of the CP6, everyone in society works together for the good of the people. This is China's miracle 1.4 billion people working together to reach hard goals. 
Since ancient times, China has always been both blessed and cursed by its geography. Thanks to the Yangtze and Yellow River systems that flow from west to east, much of eastern China has always been permanently inhabited by human civilizations for thousands of years. And with fertile floodplains almost all year round, the land itself has been able to sustain an ever-growing Chinese population. In fact, China's Yellow River Valley is one of the largest and most consistently developed pieces of arable land in the entire world. On the other hand, the northern and far western parts of the country are either dry or mountainous. From the Taklamakan and Gobi deserts in the north to the unforgiving towering landscapes of the Himalayas and the Tibetan Plateau, much of China's land to the northwest is sparsely populated and unsuitable for agriculture. This is perfectly highlighted by the fact that 94 of China's population lies east of this line. An imaginary line that divides the country into two contrasting halves. Historically, China's capital Beijing and its surrounding northern cities have long been, but as China's population and wealth grew in an unprecedented fashion in the middle of the 20th century, vital resources such as water, northern cities such as Beijing, have long relied on groundwater to sustain their populations. But because of an ever-increasing urban and industrial demand, this limited source of freshwater soon became overexploited. It also didn't help that the nearby Gobi Desert in China's Inner Mongolia, autonomous region, continuously been expanding along with more frequent dust and sand storms, as much as 3,600 square kilometers, or about twice the size of Luxembourg, of grasslands is being reclaimed by the desert every year in a process known as desertification. This desertification is mainly caused by human activities such as deforestation, climate change, and of course the aforementioned depletion of underground water sources. By the early 1950s, it became more evident that northern China would soon be unable to supply enough water population. Northern cities kept growing and water resources kept dwindling. China had to think of a way to somehow sustain hundreds of millions of people in an area that has historically been dry. In order to combat the emerging water shortage in northern China, Mao Zedong, unlike the two previous routes, the western route of China's south-north water transfer project, still in its planning stage. Among the three, it is by far the most challenging one to construct. The proposed plan for the western route is to create a series of waterways and tunnels that would connect the Yangtze River to the Yellow River through the Qinghai Tibet Plateau, which is approximately 3 to 5 kilometers above sea level. The area's topography and climate alone makes it extremely difficult to undertake this project. In addition, the western route's direction require engineers to literally carve mountains in order to cross the tricky terrain. The western route is estimated to be completed by the year 2050. Once completed, the route is estimated to bring as much as 17 cubic kilometers per year of fresh water to northern Chinese provinces. If the western route was to be completed, it could serve a combined population of nearly 100 million people along its track. There have also been unofficial plans in the past for the western route to divert water from transboundary rivers that originate from China, such as the Brahmaputra and Mekong rivers that pass through India and Southeast Asia, respectively. Although this has never been the official plan for the project, India has raised concern in the past over China's possible exploits on the Brahmapura. They worried that China's ability to manipulate the river's flow is a cause for concern for the Indian government. For the Chinese government, on the other hand, the South-North Water Transfer Project, even though it has not been fully completed, is already proving to be a huge success. According to Chinese tech media, the project benefits as much as 140 million Chinese citizens in water-starved regions. However, local and provincial Chinese governments all have different opinions on the project. One, southern upstream provinces such as Sichuan and Hubei are opposed to the plan of redirecting the Yangtze's flow to the north. For them, the construction of the project's western route would be a blow to the region's water security and hydropower sector. On the other hand, Western provinces like Gansu and Qinghai believe that the construction of the western route would bring much needed socio-economic and agricultural stability to their regions, Chinese people. In total, the entire project's cost is estimated to be around $62 billion dollars the est.
This price tag doesn't even account for the billions of dollars the Chinese government would soon need in order to maintain more than 3,000 kilometers of canals, aqueducts, dams, tunnels, and reservoirs. Despite this high financial cost, the project's original goal of supplying clean water to China's north is yet to be fully realized. So what are your thoughts about the South North Water Transfer Project? Do you think the benefits? Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more future updates. Thanks for watching.